world where it's naturally supernatural. My guest was taken to a library in heaven and directed to one book that had the missing ingredient that activates all the other gifts to greater glory heights. Revealed next. Is there a supernatural dimension? A world beyond the one we know? Is there life after death? Can our dreams contain messages from heaven? Is God ready to bring a tsunami wave of healing onto planet Earth today? Join Sid for this edition of It's Supernatural. Welcome our most important guest. Holy Spirit, you are so welcome here. I'm so happy that your presence is here and going to be poured out on the viewers. At age 12, God called Chris Reed into ministry. Now he's president and director of Morningstar Ministries and his prophetic gifting, it's very unique. Chris says that God revealed to him what is putting a break on most Christian supernatural gifting? And Chris will tell us about the big angel that escorted him to the library in heaven. Chris, I heard a little bit, but I can't wait to hear. I, and you're doing what the Bible says, the Gentile believers to provoke the Jew to jealousy. But, and I get provoked every time I do a show. Amen. <laughs> yeah, so I was caught up in the realm of the Spirit, and this angel led me through this door. And just like any library, it was like there were different sections of books. You know, in, in an earthly library, there's fiction, nonfiction, adventure, action. Well, I was drawn to the supernatural section. And some people might object to thinking their libraries in heaven, but you know, Psalm 139, 16 says, all of our days are written in his book. I believe the book of life is more than just a list of people saved and not saved. I believe it's God's perfect plan for each of our lives. And so I was drawn to this particular book in the supernatural section and I saw the book end and it said the seven spirits of God. Hmm. So I pulled it out and on the front cover of the book was the uh, spirit of the Lord. And it was listed in order as found in Isaiah chapter 11 and verse 2. I turned the front cover over and there were five white thick pages in the book. It was like each page had a book within itself. The first white page said the spirit of wisdom. The next page said the spirit of understanding. The next page, the spirit of counsel. The next page, the spirit of might. The next page, the spirit of knowledge and the back cover turned over and it said the spirit of the fear of the Lord. And I noticed when this happened, as I looked up, I looked down and the back binding of the book had been torn off, which had written on it the spirit of the fear of the Lord. And the angel of the Lord said to me, he said, do you realize what you are seeing? What you are holding in your hand is a depiction of what is happening in much of the modern church. You're holding in your left hand the front cover, the Spirit of the Lord. He said, and often you will hear in church services people say, we feel the Spirit of the Lord, we feel the presence of the Lord. He said, but when the fear of the Lord is ripped away or torn away or lost, the spirit of wisdom and revelation and counsel and might, you know, that's prophetic words, that's miracles and healings and signs and wonders and knowledge are missing. And so the lesson that the angel taught me, and this began my journey in studying the seven spirits of God, is that the fear of the Lord is what holds the fullness of the Holy Spirit. The number seven being complete or perfect. Well, the seven spirits of God represents the fullness of the Holy Spirit and all that it brings. When the fear of the Lord is put back with the others, 
then the binding takes hold again and the book becomes complete. You know, that is the missing ingredient in the church today. And guess what? The greater glory that is coming, that's the first way you'll know the greater glory is here. People, without even hearing an evangelist, when the presence pours in, will fall on their face repenting because God has drawn so close to them. Now, the early church turned the world upside down. Why? Well, Acts chapter 5 gives us a real beautiful depiction about what happens in the church when the fear of the Lord is restored. You know, the story of Ananias and Sapphira, it's kind of hard to talk about it. You know, here you have two disciples, two believers who were just dishonest about their giving. And so they both die, the husband and the wife, Ananias and Sapphira die. And, you know, many people look at that and they might think, I haven't seen anybody fall over dead. Of course, we don't want that. I haven't seen something like that happen. Well, the Lord showed me when there is an increase of His power like they had in the early book of Acts, it comes with a corresponding level of His jealousy, meaning He is jealous over His people, over our thoughts, our words, our actions. And so if you want more of His power, there's more of His jealousy. So what you would get away with in the outer court, you won't get away with in the holy place. So his jealousy comes with the corresponding measure of his power. Is it the scripture, too much is given? When that glory glo comes so close, much is required? That's right. So in Acts chapter 5, verse 11, after the Ananias and Sapphira event, it says, and great fear came upon the church and all who heard these things. And then the next three verses, verses 12 through 15 of Acts chapter 5, it tells us what follows when the fear of the Lord is brought back or it is the binding of the fullness of the Holy Spirit activity in the church. It says in verse 12, great signs and wonders were done by the hands of the apostles. It said, second thing, they were all with one accord in, in, in Solomon's porch. That's unity in the body of Christ. The third thing is it said that the rest of the people that may not have even joined the church, it said they feared and respected the church again. That means the unbelieving world respects and fears the church again. Then it goes on to say that healings, were done by Peter's shadow. And last but not least, it said believers were added to the church increasingly. So the key to the fullness of the Holy Spirit activity coming back into the church, like it did early in the book of Acts, is when the fear of the Lord, that backbinding is restored, signs and wonders come, unity comes, the power of God comes, the billion soul harvest comes, the harvest comes into the fullness, and our very shadow, Sid, will heal the sick. And this is what we've been praying for and believing for. Hey, we've seen the devil's best move. God is about ready to come front and center stage. When we return, Chris will share his revelation on the tabernacle of Moses. This triggers the next great Glory shift. Be right back. We will be right back to It's Supernatural. For he himself is our peace, who has made both Jew and Gentile into one, and broke down the barrier of the dividing wall. His purpose was to create in himself. To create in himself. His purpose was to create one new man. One new man. One new man. Adin novi chalyak. The Adam Hadash Echad. One new man. Many viewers report testimonies as a result of watching It's Supernatural. My tonsils were larger than average, and I had tonsillitis several times a year. I was hospitalized twice with Quincy, which meant having my tonsils drained with a needle and a two-day hospital stay. As it was affecting my job, I agreed to have an operation to have them removed. 
While watching your show with Dr. Francis Miles on jumping the bloodline, I jumped the line and as soon as my feet touched the ground, I felt something happening in my throat. I looked in the mirror and saw that they were shrinking. I screamed and showed my husband, then insisted on driving to my parents' house. By the time I got there, my tonsils looked normal and there was no pain. I knew I had been healed, so I called the hospital that week and canceled my operation. If you've been touched watching It's Supernatural, share your testimony at sidroth.org slash praise. We now return to It's Supernatural. What is the supernatural shift and how do we make it happen in our life? Chris? Well, the tabernacle of Moses and the tabernacle of David, God promised he would restore it before the end of the age. And so in Exodus chapter 25 and verse 40, Moses spends time up with the Lord on the mountain. And remember, he comes down from the mountain and his face shone so bright with the glory, they had to put a veil over his face. Well, while he was up there with the Lord, the Bible tells us that God tells him in verse 40, I want you to go back down into the earth and I want you to build in the earth according to the pattern I showed you in the mount. So whatever Moses saw, he saw in heaven. And so we then begin to see that what Moses built, the tabernacle, which later David brought the tabernacle, which had been mobile in the wilderness, brought it to a permanent location in Jerusalem. And so the temple housed the tabernacle or the temple. So the tabernacle later became the temple. And it really is what God showed Moses that was the man's approach to God and God's approach to man. When you entered into the tabernacle, you came to the brazen altar, which represents repentance, death, sacrifice. Then you come to the next station in the outer court and you come to the washing laver. Well, we know that water baptism, there's a washing, an initial cleansing, washing for the new believer, but an ongoing washing is the scripture says we are washed by the water of the word. So the preaching and teaching and even the reading of the word has a cleansing effect on our soul. Then we go into a second dimension of the tabernacle known as the holy place. In the holy place, we see to the left, we see the seven golden candlesticks, which according to Revelation chapter one, two, and three represents the seven churches that John wrote to in the book of Revelation, but also represents the seven spirits of God. And so the menorah, the seven lampstands, uh, you have three couplings or three branches, just like Isaiah 11 and two lists them. The spirit of the Lord is the middle branch. Then you have the spirit of wisdom and understanding, the spirit of counsel and might, the spirit of knowledge and the fear of the Lord. So the same branch where the oil that fuels the spirit of wisdom fuels the spirit of revelation. The same oil that fuels the spirit of counsel fuels might, signs, wonders, and miracles. The same branch that fuels the knowledge, fear of the Lord. And it produces light so the priest can go on the opposite end of the holy place and feed from the showbread. We know that that was a type and shadow of Jesus who said, I am that bread which came down from heaven. So the seven golden candlesticks or the seven spirits of God produce light or illumination so that we know how to feed from the life of Christ. Then there was a veil put in Moses' tabernacle to separate the holy place from the third dimension of the tabernacle, which was the holy of holies, which contained the Ark of the Covenant. The Ark of the Covenant had a mercy seat. It had cherubims, golden cherubims up over it. And inside of the ark contained Aaron's budding rod, which symbolized the miraculous, contained the manna, which symbolized God's provision, and the law, which contains God's nature. We know that when Jesus died on the cross, when Yeshua died, the veil was torn. But we know that earthly tabernacle was a picture of the heavenly tabernacle that Moses saw in Exodus 25, 40. So he built it in the earth. 
It's the same thing said that Isaiah saw in Isaiah 6, chapter 6, verse 1. He said, In the year that King Uzziah died, I saw the Lord sitting on a throne, high and lifted up, and his train filled the temple. And then he asked for one of the angels Isaiah did to bring a coal from off the altar. What altar? The altar in the temple. So the temple of the old covenant was a picture, a type and shadow of the reality of the heavenly tabernacle or the heavenly temple that John, now this is, this is key, John was caught up in Revelation chapter 4 and he's standing before the throne of God and he is literally seeing the heavenly holy of holies because God is sitting on a throne Okay, and you have the 24 elders, you have the angels. John had access to the throne room. And it says in Revelation 1, verse 12, he said, I turned and looked behind me, and I saw one like the Son of Man standing in the midst of the seven golden candlesticks. Well, how is it that the seven golden candlesticks are right in front of the throne of God? Well, if you understand that heaven is the form of the tabernacle that was built in the earth, then you know that John had access to the Holy of Holies or the throne room of God, the throne room realities. That's why he could turn around and see the seven golden candlesticks because there was no longer a veil between the holy place and the holy of holies. And he saw Jesus in the midst of the seven churches, and he saw Jesus in the midst of the seven golden candlesticks, which represents the seven spirits of God. So the reality is that earthly tabernacle was a picture of a heavenly tabernacle reality. We now have access to that throne of God, which was embodied earthly, on the Ark of the Covenant. That's why it's the throne of God. You have a mercy seat. You have the angels, the cherubims, the same thing Isaiah saw, the angels crying one to another, holy, holy, holy. That's what was over the mercy seat, and that's what Moses built. It's the same thing Isaiah saw in Isaiah 6, and it's the same thing that John saw in Revelation chapter 4 and 5. You teach about... Yeah, that is good. You teach about turning the tabernacle heavenward. Yeah. So if you take the horizontal tabernacle and you turn it up vertical, not only does it form the shape of the cross, okay, because you have the brazen altar, the washing laver, over here you have the seven golden candlesticks, over here you have the a table of showbread, then you go beyond the veil into the Holy of Holies. But this is also a picture of the glorified body of Yeshua. John said in Revelation chapter 1 through 3, he said, when he saw the glorified Christ represented, he said his feet were like brass. Well, what was the first piece of furniture in the outer court? The brazen altar. Then you go beyond the brazen altar and you come to the washing laver. Out of his side came blood and water. And then in Revelation chapter 3 and chapter 4, it says, In his right hand were the seven stars and the seven golden candlesticks. So that means out of his left hand is where he feeds us daily as we feed from Christ the bread which came down from heaven. But Paul said we're to not stop in our spiritual progression. He said the fivefold ministry in Ephesians 4, apostle, prophet, evangelist, pastor, and teacher, are to bring us under the full measure of the stature of Christ. Well, how can you measure up to the stature of Christ unless you see the glorified body of the Lord Jesus Christ as the tabernacle or the temple of God, which we now are? Paul went on to say in Ephesians 4, until we all come into the full measure of the stature of Christ, even unto the head, which is Christ. What is the head of Christ? The Holy of Holies, the throne room. So the purpose of the fivefold ministry is to bring us in our spiritual progression beyond our present church experience, beyond outer court Christianity, even beyond the holy place, to live beyond the veil. 
to live and experience the throne room realities, the throne room of heaven that is available to each of us. As the Hebrew writer said, therefore let us come boldly before the throne of grace that we may obtain mercy and find grace to help in the time of need. So God is calling his people, Sid, into the throne room. And when we come into the head, which is Christ, the full measure of the stature of Christ, we'll receive the mind of Christ, the power of Christ, the communion of Christ, and we will abide beyond the veil. I'll tell you what, at the conclusion of this show, please join our live show actually right now at sidroth.org forward slash prophecy, where my special guest, Chris Reed, will pray for you to receive revelation that will trigger the greater glory shift in your life. If you have not made Jesus your Messiah and Lord, with your mouth say, Jesus, I'm sorry. Forgive me of all my sins. Come and live inside of me. I make you my Messiah and my Lord. Chris, will you pray for people right now? Father, I pray for every person watching right now that they will become aware that the throne room of heaven is available to them. Father, release every person in the fullness of their destiny. Let them peer beyond the veil and see what's written in that book that where all their days were written when there were none of them fashioned. Let them feed from Christ and let the fullness of the Holy Spirit, the seven spirits of God, not just live in them, but rest on them as they come into their greater glory in the matchless name of Yeshua, the Messiah. Amen. God's going to heal a few people right now, Chris. <laughs> Pray right now, one minute. Father, right now, there's a man that is watching whose name is Steve. He had cancer in the past, but now he has concerns and symptoms in his body that the cancer is coming back. But I declare, Steve, the cancer will not come in the name of the Lord Jesus, Yeshua the Messiah. You are cancer free. There's a woman named Brenda. 12 years ago, you were in a car accident and you've had hip problems from the whiplash and now they're saying that you might need a hip replacement. Healing warmth is coming through your body right now. As the glory of God comes to you, you're receiving healing. By His stripes, you are healed. By the powerful name that is above every name, receive it now in the name of Yeshua, amen. Few people realize that the Hebrew Scriptures detail how to identify the true Messiah. The Jewish prophet Jeremiah spoke of a new covenant that would do three things the Mosaic Covenant could not do. First, the Scriptures would be inside of us. Second, we would know God personally, experientially. Third. God would atone for and then forget our sins forever. I'm Sid Roth, a Jewish follower of the Messiah. Download my free ebook detailing my supernatural experience with Jesus and irrefutable proof that Jesus is the very Messiah we Jewish people have been waiting for for centuries. Go to SidRoth.org forward slash think. The supernatural of God knows no bounds, and now there are no limits to equipping you to receive your supernatural miracle anytime, any place. ISN, the It's Supernatural online network is now available for your mobile devices and smart TVs. The message of the Bible has not changed, but it's a 21st century world out there. And how we learn about God's miraculous direction for our lives has changed. ISN takes our anointed programs out of the box and gives you complete freedom to watch what you want, when you want, and where you want. 
ISN offers live streaming of programs 24 hours a day, seven days a week, right on your mobile devices or smart TVs. Or you can choose from dozens of powerful episodes of exclusive programs in our online library. Get ready to receive your supernatural breakthrough whenever you need it, wherever you are. Download the free ISN app today. Your gifts to this ministry will help Sid air It's Supernatural in Israel 28 times a week and distribute his evangelistic book to the Jewish people worldwide. Do you feel as if God's not listening when you pray or speaking back to you? I've been there and so have all of my guests. That's why I want you to go to SidRoth.org slash prayer to access interviews with guests who have discovered how to pray unstoppable prayers. Learn about our free prayer app called God Talk and leave a prayer request so we can pray for you. It's more than time for your breakthrough.